Our message tonight is entitled, Sodom Bound. I'm going to the book of St. Luke, chapter 17, and beloved, tonight, I hope you have your blank paper as you come in the door, you should get that along with your quiz card. And then keep our pencils a little while and write some of these down. Look at them again when you go home. As we continue, other messages of different sorts will come, and you'll want to be sure that what is said out here is Bible-based. And I've challenged audiences all over the world. If I tell you and it's not in the Bible, I'm a liar. You're not required to believe Charles D. Brooks, but you ought to believe God. So it's a good habit to not just listen, but go home and check. Make sure that preacher's telling you the truth and that his comments are backed up by the Word of God. Now there'll be more critical messages, so get in the habit of doing this. You and the Lord are going to get to know each other better if you'll do that. Amen? Luke chapter 17, I'm beginning with verse 26, and Jesus is speaking in these verses. If you have the red letter editions, this is in red. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Jesus is talking about the end time. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat. They drank. They married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat. They drank. They bought. They sold. They planted. They builded. In other words, they seemed totally oblivious to the fact that judgment was imminent. The Lord said it would be like that in the last days. Folk will be so consumed with the business of buying homes. Nothing wrong with buying a home. But folks' minds will be obsessed so much with temporal things and worldly things that they won't be aware that judgment is about to come. The hammer of God's justice is about to fall. They'll be so busy with this world, they won't have time to think of the world to come. And Christ said it'll be like it was in the days of Lot. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Now in Scripture, Jesus here is the prophet. And Jesus says quite clearly, we will return to the conditions which pertained in Sodom and in Gomorrah as we near the coming of our Lord. Jesus said it's going to be that way in the days just before the Lord Jesus returns. As a matter of fact, I left that text a little faster than I wanted to. It says, but the same day Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire. Verse 30, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. I should have read that to you. So we know that we're talking about the day when Christ shall be revealed from heaven. He said, on earth. As we approach the day that I am to appear, it will be like Sodom. It will be like Sodom. And please remember, beloved, Christ gave this prophecy himself. Do you know anything about Sodom? What was Sodom like? Even as I was preparing this message, I wanted to go back and refresh my own mind. I went back again and looked at Genesis 19. Sodom, the name of a great city. Sodom, the name of a proud, progressive city. Sodom, the name of an affluent city. A prosperous city. And also a name that is associated with that which is perverted and evil and vile. The city has given its name to a sin so wretched men don't like to mention it. And that is the sin of sodomy. If you don't know what that means, and if I don't get up the nerve to tell you, look it up in your dictionary. My wife and I descended into the Jordan Valley some time ago. Uh, incidentally, that valley is the lowest place on earth, and I mean by that, it's the lowest place below sea level. 
And when you start down the winding road into that valley, you feel the temperature rising. And when you reach the level part of the valley, you know that it is the lowest place on earth, for it is hot and humid most of the time. The Jordan River threads through that valley, running all the way from the lake of uh, Gennesaret, or the Sea of Galilee, down through that valley to the Dead Sea. We pulled off our shoes and we waded out into the Dead Sea. The salt content is considered greater than at Salt Lake in Utah. Most Bible scholars believe that beneath the waters of the Dead Sea are the remnants of Sodom and Gomorrah and Zoar, a city nearby. Now when you stop and think that everybody died in this town except three people, ladies and gentlemen, out of your heart of hearts there must come a question, why? And you must say, your sense of justice must declare, there's got to be some justification for an act so terrible, even from God. God's got to have a reason for doing this. A merciful God must not only have a reason, but he must indicate those things in the Bible so that our minds may be at ease. In your imagination right now, you can see Lot and his daughters fleeing the Holocaust. In your imagination right now, you can almost hear the thunder of God's judgment. In your imagination right now, you can see the sky darkened, the air redolent with the choking fumes of sulfur and brimstone. In your imagination, you can see the lightning dancing in terrifying display, the flash and explosion in dreadful cadence. This is the day of judgment in Sodom. Above all, you can hear the deafening screams of the damned behind Sodom's walls. Why? God, why? Why did you have to do that? What are the sins of Sodom that brought down the wrath of God? First of all, I want to make one thing very clear. God never punishes without, first of all, with great long-suffering, showing mercy and sending warnings and pleading with people to repent. He even sent angels into that town. And it is evident from the story that angels could not change the minds of the people. I've come to conclude that in Washington, D.C. tonight, if an angel came down, some people would not do right. It's a terrible comment on the, on the mind of man. What were the sins of Sodom? Well, let's begin with pride. Oh, you said that doesn't sound so bad. Don't you know that God said six things I hate, yea, seven, and pride is number one? Don't you know it was pride that brought Lucifer down to be a devil? And don't you know that it was pride that ruined our first parents? Eve was told by the devil, if you eat the forbidden fruit, you'll be like God. And this desire, this ambition, this pride blinded her eyes and she was deceived. God hates pride, and the city was diapered in pride. And then with pride came ease. These two seem to go together. The more people have, the less inclined they are to worship God. And that's too bad, for God owns the gold and the silver and the cattle upon a thousand hills, and he'd like to share it with all his people everywhere. But don't you know if God did that, most of us would forget about him? Some of us only serve him because we're having it so hard. We only get on our knees because the load is heavy on our shoulders. We only look up because we're flat of our backs. And in his dark providence, God permits it sometimes in order to save us. Their sin was pride and ease. An idle mind is still the devil's workshop. When folk are not busy and industrious, they generally think of mischief and carry it out. And then there was a sin of pleasure madness. They thought that life was an interminable round of cheap pleasure. And that's all they wanted to do. And how like that we are today. Oh, look, admit it, we are like that today. We can't stand a quiet moment of meditation. We can't stand to be alone with ourselves. We can't stand to have the TV off and just talk to honey. 
All day long, it's music and television. And when we turn it off, we're headed to the theater or the dance hall or the nightclub. You know that's right. And we stay there until we're worn out and we go home and drop right in the bed without prayer. Pleasure mad. And when people are like that, they usually have a taste for that which is sensual. That which is sexy and which appeals to carnal nature. By the way, the prevailing sin of Sodom was immorality. And it seemed that everything they loved and everything they read and everything they listened to and everything they wanted to watch was corrupt and corrupting and corrupting. Immorality was the principal sin of Sodom. One day in researching this, I ran across a scholar who said they offered prizes to men and women who could invent some new wickedness. Early tonight I mentioned this phrase that popped into my head, progressive excesses. Man's life outside of God is a progression of one sin after another, and each sin has to be more tantalizing and more fascinating or we become bored. In other words, a fellow who drinks a beer will end up wanting liquor, and if he keeps it up, he'll take dope, he'll sniff cocaine. We go from bad to worse without God. You start off with an immodest bikini, and you'll end up with a string bikini. Then you'll end up topless, and after that, nude. We go from one degree of sin to another. Our children start off with cigarettes and end up with marijuana and white elephants and yellow jackets and all of those things they are popping in that we don't know about. They loved dirt in Sodom. And when they had tried it all and were getting bored with what they had tried, they decided we'd better put some money in a pot and we'll offer prizes to the man or woman who can come up with a new kick. And your mind cannot imagine the degradation that went on in Sodom. The music blasted incessantly and sounded like the laughter of demons. Their version of the disco jumped day and night, seven days a week, and they danced. Well, from time to time we get questions about dancing, ladies and gentlemen. There is a kind of dancing that has sensual connotations. And, and if I had the time, I'd like to develop this with you sometimes. You ought to look up dancing and how it started and what it means. And in nearly every case, the dance is associated with sex. The gyrating of the hips and all the other things that go on are sensual. They are intended to be that way. No need kidding ourselves with some kind of pitiful naivete. It is sensual and it appeals to the flesh. And most of the dances today are just plain vulgar and immoral. Unrestrained vice, concupiscence, lasciviousness, that's a good word. I heard Dr. Wesley, who spoke to you tonight, say one day, he looked this word up and it refers to old men who like young girls. And most of them can't get young girls, so they go to peep shows. That's lasciviousness. They're too old to do anything, so they watch. And you can hardly walk up and down the streets of Washington anymore without seeing the adult bookstores and the peep shows. Huh? Sodom! In addition to that, the people of Sodom were defiant. They loved their dirt and they were proud. And they would not listen to anyone who tried to dissuade them or turn them from it. They would not listen. And there's something insulting to God about people who will not listen. Over and over and over again, Jesus said, if you have an ear, hear. Listen. Heed. But they would not listen. They were unashamed of anything they did, and they laughed in the faces of men who tried to correct them. They could put up a powerful argument condemning whatever you tried to say and defending their dirt, and it's like that now. One day on Donahue, 
a talk show, they had this group advocating gay rights. And whenever they spoke, they are filth and blasphemous. The people applauded. And when someone said, but I don't think that's right, they groaned. That's Sodom. And then there was violence. I'm telling you about Sodom tonight. And you think I'm telling you about Washington. Well, I am. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the days when the Son of Man is revealed. Christ is about to come back here, and we are seeing Sodom in D.C. And you can see it in New York, you can see it in Baltimore, you can see it in these little small towns like Alexandria and Arlington and Laurel, Maryland. Sodom. And there was violence. Life was cheap. When people are caught up in pleasure, they don't want to work. And when folk don't want to work, they still don't lose their appetite for material possessions. So if you don't work and get your money, the only other way is to steal and take it. And they would knock you in the head for a dime. They'll do it in Washington, D.C. You go out and work hard and earn your money through the sweat of your brow, and these fellows think they've got a right to put a gun in your ribs and take it away. It is their profession. It's the only thing they can do. Some were interviewed on television once in a documentary, and they said, but there are jobs available. And one said, how much do you make? And he said, you can make $100 a week. He said, I can make more that than that in an hour, stealing. Sodom, you see, Sodom's in the mind. And violence talked the streets. They hated those who sounded warnings, those who offered restraints. Violence. They turned against those who were good. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, we are there. Did you hear what I said? We are there. When I began to preach 28 years ago, I used to read that text that I began with tonight, and I honestly believed it. Now, I can I tell the truth. I believed it. I don't preach anything I don't believe. I may not always understand it, but I believe it if God says it. So I believed it. But I was living in a period of, uh, characterized by Victorian ideals. They had a, an office in Hollywood that controlled the morals of the movies to some extent. And I knew about that, and I studied into all of these things. The Catholic Church had a priest in Hollywood who was there to kind of guide those folks and control the morals of the movie industry. By the way, that's all done away with now. If it's dirt and if it's done, it'll come on the screen. And that's what your children are watching sometimes when you are glad to get rid of them. Amen. Now, I believe that. But I honestly used to say, Lord... If you're coming soon, how can this happen in my day? How can we come to the place where anything goes? How can we come to the place where you can walk down a street as I did in this town and look in a plate glass window and see pictures that will make a grown man turn away and blush? How can we come to an age where women will dance nude on a stage before applauding audiences, men and women together? How could we come to an age when women will jam a nightclub to watch men strip? But Sodom is here. What's it all about, preacher? Galatians chapter 5, and I read verse 19. Now the works of the flesh. The works of what? The works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? And then it lists them. Adultery, that's the work of the flesh. Fornication, that's moral uncleanness, which includes adultery. And homosexuality. It includes not only the act, but the love of it. Going to places where you see it performed. You understand, I'm, we've got some children here. Now the works of the flesh are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, there's that word again, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, what's that? Reveling is partying and dancing, that's what it means. And God says that's the work of the flesh. 
and such like, of which I told you before, I told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit, shall not inherit the kingdom of God, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you believe the word of God if you do? Say amen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I didn't write that. God said, folks involved in that, not only doing it, but watching it done on the silver screen and paying to get into these adult clubs. They shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't have any illusion or idea that Pastor Brooks is going to change Washington. The majority of the people don't even want to hear the word of the Lord. I know that. But somebody does. You see, God said to me, you go and preach as a witness. You don't have to make anybody do it. You just tell them somebody is going to do right. Somebody here tonight wants to serve God. I know that. Am I right? Somebody here tonight only wants to know what the Lord wants done. And then they will say, Lord, thy will be done. Somebody here tonight wants to please Jesus. God sent me to talk to you. If you read on, it tells you what the fruits of the Spirit are. They're love, joy, peace, and so forth. There is today in our country a fear, a a timid uh, fear, this trepidation men have, even who are called to preach, stand to tell the people the truth. Now, ladies and gentlemen, by the grace of God, I don't want to insult anybody. I don't want to be misunderstood. I don't want to be hard and overbearing. And I'll tell you right now, I don't preach as someone who's already overcome way up in the air. I'm down here in this mess with you. Every day I have to pray to overcome. Every day I beg for power to live for God. So I'm not talking to you as one who's way up yonder. I'm down here. But as surely as God called me to preach, I've got to tell you the truth or die. And if I couldn't do that, I'd give it up. And I mean that with every ounce of my being. I didn't want to be a preacher anyhow. And I told God that when he called me. And I said, no, I'll do it. But I want something to preach. And I want a message. I'm not going to be namby-pamby. I want to know what the truth is. And I want you to tell me how to say it. And may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I don't do it. There are some things, as the Latin puts it, that are malum in say, evil in themselves. And they will never be right. If you live a thousand years, it's never going to be right to commit adultery. It's never going to be right to shack up and live without benefit of marriage. It's never going to be right to practice homosexuality. I don't care what the doctor says or the psychiatrist. I don't care what the weak preacher says. It is wrong. Our job is not to make people comfortable in sin. It's to preach spiritual regeneration. I'm telling the man who does that, you can make it. You don't have to live like that. And I'm saying to you, if you've done the worst thing I've mentioned tonight, the same God that saved me can save you. And he's going to save prostitutes. He's going to save drunkards. He's going to save dope addicts. Bless God, there are going to be some homosexuals in heaven. But all of them will have overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Not going up there doing it. Not on your life, beloved. I'm not trying then to accommodate carnal desire. I know what temptation is, and I know I have to fight. So I'm telling you, fight. Don't make your excuse, well, I couldn't have it. Yes, you can. If you can't, there's somebody who can. If you're weak, there's somebody who's strong. (laughs) And that somebody cares about you. Now, consider Sodom. In that brief picture I've given you, and now consider our day. And be honest. We've come to a time there's hardly anywhere to go for entertainment. It is all tainted and corrupted with flesh. There is a word, I won't say a lot about it, it's pornography. You know what it means. Have you ever, ever dreamed it would be so? Nothing is left to the imagination. Sodom is here. Consider 
the music that we listen to, with its pagan beat that mesmerizes and, and, and hypnotizes. Don't you know that psychiatrists have proven they can take a steady rhythm and hypnotize people and make them do anything they want them to do? And that's what the music is doing. People under its control are under the spirit of demons. And they call it music. Have you ever listened to the words? The popular music of today extols and promotes fornication. The most popular disco singer was in a church choir, and this bugs me so much. So many of them who do it for money started out singing gospel. And, and, and we've come to a time when gospel is perverted, and you don't even know what you're listening to. And she is called the Queen of Lust. Ebony Magazine, a few weeks, months back. The Queen of Lust. Let me start all over. If you listen to the words, you'll discover that the majority of today's music extols and promotes fornication, lust, marijuana, coke, lawlessness, disobedient to parents. I should have made a, a noun of that disobedience. In the music! And our children are throbbing with the beat. And parents say, I don't listen to that stuff. Maybe you ought to listen. Just long enough to know what to say to your children. We're there. Sodom, we're there. Stop and think about dress. Don't you know that we don't decide what the styles will be? That decision is made by a few drum beaters for profit. Are you listening to me? And a large number of them are themselves effeminates. And they know that if they can make the clothing clingy and revealing, it will appeal to the base passions of men and women. They know that in order to make more money, they must sell less clothing. A few years back, it was a miniskirt, and that thing went up till it became micro mini. Then it started down, and some of us said, thank the Lord. Well, they've got it down now, but they've slit the rotten thing on both sides. <laughs> oh, listen, beloved, the devil knows what he's doing. If he can keep a man's mind on a low level, that man is not going to pray. The devil knows what he's doing. It seems so innocuous. Well, remember, the devil is insidious and cunning. He doesn't come out and show his hand. He plays it secretly. He knows what he's doing. That's why we've got to have spiritual perception or we won't know what he's doing. But I'm telling you tonight, he knows what he's doing. And when a woman will go in and buy certain of these garments, she knows what she's doing. Her purpose is to make men turn their heads. Good men who love their wives, even preachers in the pulpit, they know what they're doing. Sodom is here. And at the same time of this heavy emphasis on flesh, rape is up 98%. Men, sick men, bad men, driven by flesh. Driven by these carnal desires out of control. These men, driven by what they see in the movies and in the pictures they buy and in the stories and the jokes that they hear, are turning in their sickness against men and women, boys and girls. And rape is up almost 100% over a year ago. And the majority of those raped are between 9 and 17 years of age. And we are filled with rage when we hear of it, but we are promoting it. Men's carnal minds are inflamed. Sin is a mental disease, after all. And it still is true that anybody who would rather serve the devil than serve the Lord is not clear. Anybody who would rather go to hell than go to heaven is not wrapped tight. It's as simple as that. A mental disease. Now, there are some powerful parallels in Scripture. Uh, uh, we are told that whatever happened to Israel happened for us as examples upon whom the ends of the world have come. One great writer has said, we are repeating the history of the Jews. 
So many things that happen to them are symbolic, representative of things that are happening to us. Now let's go back to that time when the Lord led Israel out of uh, Egypt toward the promised land. They had spent 40 years in the wilderness because of their unbelief. And finally, God leads this new breed to the very brink of the promised land. Heavenly Canaan is symbolized by earthly Canaan. Amen? The old Negroes, even when they were slaves, understood this when they talked about crossing Jordan into the promised land. That's what they were talking about. It's a parallel, you see. Now we are told that as Israel was on the march and was getting ready to go into Canaan, they had come to the place they could see the hills of, uh, of Judea. They had come to the place where they could actually look across Jordan into the land flowing with milk and honey. God stopped them right there at Beth Beor. And God said, now before you walk over, there's some things you've got to get straight. And one of the things that was done was God had Moses repeat his commandments to them. Moses would die without going over. In his final sermon, he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And he went through God's commandments. He wanted his people to understand, you've got to be sanctified before you're fit to cross over. Now, while God was trying to get them ready for the promised land, the devil was not sitting down taking a nap. The devil decided to counteract God's program. And we are told that the last weapon which the devil used against the Jews before they crossed over was immorality. He got the Philistine women to come into the camp of Israel to turn the heads of God's menfolk and orgies of filth broke out. And here were people on the border of the promised land, but they could not go over because of immorality. And there is the parallel. Today, we are on the very brinks of the promised land. Jesus is about to come. We are just waiting now to get everybody ready who wants to go. We are at Beth Peor. We are at the place where we can almost see the splendor gleaming from the domes afar. See the glory streaming through the gates ajar. We're almost home. And at the very moment Christ is ready to gather his people, the devil said, Okay, it's time for my last weapon. Immorality. Immorality. Sodom. Sodom. Are we there? And there are some who say, well, why is that so important? It's important because the mind that thinks filth cannot live purely. You can't live straight and think crooked. Devil knows that, beloved. And he knows the flesh. He knows what feels good. He knows what looks good. The devil knows he doesn't have to get you to go and commit overt adultery against your wife. Jesus said that's the letter of the law. But the spirit of the law is this, that if you look at her and lust, you've committed adultery already. So the devil doesn't care whether you do it, if he can just get you to think about it and to dream about it and to look at the pictures and to look at these flirts. And if he can get your mind down here... You won't go up there. And that's what it's all about. The battle between Christ and Satan is the battle for the control of men's minds. And so it matters. Let me read some things quickly. Now, I've got to bring this portion to a close. I'm determined to keep time in mind from night to night. So just listen to the word of the Lord. First Thessalonians 4. Three, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye abstain from fornication. It matters. That's the will of God. Your sanctification is God's will. What does sanctification mean? Holiness. Holiness. God wants us to be holy. And in order to be holy, you've got to abstain from fornication, moral uncleanness. First Thessalonians 4 and the next verse. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. God has given us bodies, and God said your body is supposed to be the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now you must control your body, and you must possess your vessel. Don't let anybody else handle it and fool with it and fumble over it. You ladies, your bodies are sacred. And if you don't keep that in mind, the fellow who fools with it won't think of it that way. You are not a thing to be loved then, but a thing to be used. 
Now, I'm being plain. I'm not going to talk about this forever, but last night and the night, I want us to get it. God says your body is mine. You're bought with a price. What do you want with it, Lord? I want to come and live in you by the Holy Ghost. I want to live in you in such a way that you don't even have to testify for folks to know you've been with Jesus. They'll just look at you and know. So what do you want us to do, Lord? Possess your vessel in sanctification and in honor. The greatest damage to marriage today is caused by disrespect. It's not so much what others think of you, but what you think of yourself. And when you've been fooling around, no matter what others say, you know that you're not worth a dime. And it is this loss of self-respect that is so fatal. Verse 5 of the same chapter says, Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Oh, but young people say, Pastor, what shall we do? We, we want to experience these things. I'll tell you what God said and what Paul said. He said, get married. Better to marry than to burn. Amen. Well, Paul, what about marriage? He goes on to say in Hebrews thirteen four, marriage is honorable. You see, God is not against sex. Thank the Lord. He's not against sex. God doesn't want you never to indulge sex. He wants you to be clean and pure until you're married. Then God said that same thing that is so defiling and debauching and dishonorable, that same thing which will reproach you and shame you and ruin you, that same thing in marriage is honorable. That's why the devil is against marriage. Do you hear what I said? And in case you don't know what Paul is talking about, he becomes very plain. He said marriage is honorable. By the way, if that's honorable, then this that you do without marriage is dishonorable. Amen? Now back to the text. Marriage is honorable. The bed undefiled. Amen. That's clear, isn't it? But he says, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. That's Hebrews 13, 4. Now let's read some things very quickly. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. You ought to write that down. I don't have time to read it. 2 Timothy 2, 22. The Bible says, flee youthful lusts. Run from them. Flee them. Uh, you got to start here. In 1 Corinthians 5, 9, Paul said, I wrote to you to an epistle not to company with fornicators. 1 Corinthians 5, 9. Don't even go around with folks who are dirty. And don't go sit in an audience to watch it. Amen. How practical God is. Watch your ear. Watch what you hear. When you go in as a stage, make sure that what you hear will not defile you and make you soiled. Then he said, watch what you look at. Psalms 101 and verse 3, David said, I will set no evil thing before my eyes. That means that Larry Flynn's Hustler magazine and Hugh Hefner's Playboy, these things have no place in your hand, in your home, in your car, in your possession. What do you say, man, out there? That's plain, ain't it? Bible says that. And now we've talked about the ear and the eye. Don't touch. <laughs> Hands off. You know, there are, there are gestures, and we black folks especially are gregarious and friendly, and we touch, we shake hands, we slap on the back. Isn't that right? And, and, and sometimes we hug, and when it's done before 500 people, I don't think there's any evil in it. Hope not. But if you discover a weakness when that happens, then I got a rule for you. Don't touch anybody under eight. Or over 80. Or anybody all in between. Touch not. Proverbs 23:33 says, leave wine alone. For if you get drunk, your eyes will behold strange women. Amen. You got to take yourself in hand. Preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying what God says. Possess yourself. Control yourself. Take yourself in hand. You can't control everybody else, but you can control you. Amen. And I don't care if you're working on it, if you're weak, at least pray and work on this thing. You've got to say, I don't look. Ear, don't listen. Hand, don't touch. What's at stake? Your honor, your sanctification. Your salvation. These things are at stake. I've got some things I wish I could read to you, but I don't have time to. I think I'm going to read this one. It's in the book of Proverbs, chapter 6. And I want you to listen. 
Proverbs chapter 6, and I'm going to read beginning with verse 23. Is that the one I want? Uh, no, that isn't the one I want. Let me read another. It's in Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 7, and this is what the Bible says. Listen. Proverbs 7, 7. It says, And beheld. Well, if you read verse 6, For at the window of my house I looked through the casement, and beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths a man void of understanding. That's a foolish man. Passing through the street near her corner. The minute he was seen going near her house, he wasn't in the house, he just going toward it. If you got a weakness, stay away from her house. As a matter of fact, stay away from her neighborhood. Oh, but you say, Pastor, you see, I know how we rationalize you. you. You see, Pastor, the only reason I was by there is because I work over here and I live over there and I, and I go straight. Go that way! Your wife doesn't want to hear excuses. You ought to read the rest of that. I won't take time to do it. Uh, Proverbs 6 and verse 12, the Bible says, listen, Proverbs 6, 12, the Bible says these words, uh, A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a fraud mouth. He winketh his eyes. He speaketh with his feet. He teacheth with his fingers. Frowardness is in his heart. He deviseth mischief continually. He soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. You ladies, watch him. These handsome birds who look at you a certain way, always winking. Watch them! What are you doing? Possess yourself in honor. You belong to God. You're one of his children. Would you say amen out there? Be careful. Don't let this thing happen to you. Get all wrapped up in this mess. And you won't be spiritual. There are certain moral incongruities. You can't get involved in this and love the Lord. You can't get involved in the filthy theater and enjoy prayer meeting. Simple as that. You can't read Playboy and enjoy reading the Bible. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. You're going to love one and hate the other as surely as you're born into this world. There's another text I started to read to you, men. God warns in Proverbs, he said, don't let her take you with her eyelids. You know how they flirt and blink. God said, don't let that bother you. You'll come down to hell. Amen. 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 In closing, just as the screen is coming down, there was a person who got out of Sodom. There was a person, I say, who got out of Sodom and yet died. There is a person who heard God's warning and responded to God's warning and actually got out of the city. A person almost saved. There is a person who was snatched out by the providence of God. Holy angels literally snatched her up. And with her husband and her daughters, she got outside of the doomed city. And in the mountains ahead was refuge. She almost made it. But she turned back. Here was a woman who heard the thunder of God's wrath. A woman who smelled the smoke and the sulfur. Here was a woman who heard the, the, the thunderous crash of lightning. Here was a woman who felt the ground shake. She heard the roofs crashing in. She heard the screaming of the damned. Here was a woman who saw where sin leads and knew its results. And she got out. And yet she died. She perished. She was destroyed. Her problem was that for some reason she had lingering in her heart a desire for the old paths of sin. She remembered the pleasure she'd had back there. She didn't experience a complete victory. She was a little bit disgusted with the restraints of the spiritual life, as we are today. You find young people plunging headlong into dope and into sex 
sand into ruin. But the minute you tell them to live right, oh, that's hard. Oh, it's incredible. It's incredible. And so tonight, I want to simply quote Jesus. In a verse all by itself in Luke 17, Jesus said, Remember Lot's wife. In researching this, I found something I never knew before. I found historical record that when that woman was turned to a pillar of salt, her body stood out in the wilderness, in the desert, as a memorial for over 2,000 years. Josephus, who lived at the time of Christ, said he saw her. So when Jesus said, remember Lot's wife, he was talking to some people who had seen this salt stature wasting away in the wilderness. They knew what it meant. It is a warning found in Genesis 17 and in Luke 17 against loving this world more than we love God. It's a warning of the Old Testament. It's a warning of the New Testament. Remember Lot's wife. When you start out of Sodom, don't look back. It's flee or perish. As the lights go down and we go to the screen just briefly. Follow me. The Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest prophet of all, draws back the curtain and gives us a look into the future. Those who love the Lord and those who are willing to learn from him may know what the future holds. In Luke 17, there it is, what I've read to you tonight. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Those are the words of Christ. Well, how were they in Sodom? Paul said they are lovers of pleasures in the last days, more than lovers of God. That's the way they were in Sodom. Paul says they have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Oh, they go to church. And if you ask them if they're Christians, they'll say yes. I want to talk about this tomorrow night. If you ask them, are you a Christian? Oh, yes. Do you believe? Oh, yes. But you go to the disco and there they are. You go into the tavern and there they are. You go to the peep show and the deacon's on the front row. They have a form of godliness, but not enough power to put away a stinking cigarette. Not enough power to break a whiskey bottle. Not enough power to be true to a good wife. So from such, turn away. We're a pleasure man. That's a picture of Las Vegas. Sort of typifies a modern Sodom. Now, I've spent several nights there at different times passing through. And you feel almost scared that the lightning's going to flash or an earthquake will occur when you know what's going on in Las Vegas. People today seem to be pleasure mad. It's all they think about. There are some folk whose show budgets are more than their grocery budgets. And then there's the divorce problem. The trend is going up all... This was 1946. In 1960, it was simply projected that one out of two marriages would end in divorce. Those figures are real tonight. And you've got to consider that a lot of folks don't even get married. So we're not talking about everybody. A lot of folks just shack up. Of those who do get married, half of them will get a divorce. J. Edgar Hoover said, these are some slides I've had for uh, six or seven years. J. Edgar Hoover said, a major crime is committed every 22 seconds. An aggravated assault or rape every hour, every hour, 365 days of the year in America alone. A murder every 40 minutes. There are 60 suicides in our nation every day. It's worse now. Are you listening? Crime on the increase. The Bible says it's a sign that we're living in the last days. Hoover said five or six years ago, there are more barmaids in this country than college girls. It's worse now. You get on an airplane and fly across this country, and these fine, bright girls who are airline stewardesses are glorified barmaids. 
They spent half their time trotting drinks up and down the aisle. And you know, I'm a fellow who always was blessed with a good appetite. And sometimes I've just worked awfully hard, run to the airport, drop in a seat, and I'm famished. I want to eat. Don't you know before you can eat, everybody else got a drink? And you sit there hungry as everything, waiting on liquor to be served. It's a shame, isn't it? And then you watch it in your living room. You don't even have to go out anymore to see it. Sodom is here. And people learn from what they see on television. You ought to be careful what your children watch. Amen. And then we get into all these vile habits of Sodom. Uh, you know, I, I, the, the CC man is back. You know what that means? Canadian club. That's a liquor. And when they make these ads, they always get nice-looking young people. And they want you to think you're going to look like that if you drink. Well, I ought to, I got some, you know, Bob Willis and I, we have pictures of folk who are drunk. We ought to bring those and show you how folks really look. Liquor makes a, a gentleman a bum and turns a lady into a tramp. Uh, that's what was in Ebony Magazine. Look at that picture. You know, they paid hundreds of thousands of dollars just to get that picture in Ebony Magazine. Look at it. It makes you think you haven't lived. Until you do that. And all the while, our youth are being dissipated and debauched. Marijuana and dope. Lives ruined forever. Ladies and gentlemen, the streets are full of immoral nitwits tonight. Drugs have blown their minds. Acid and certain other kinds of drugs can destroy the brain and turn it to jelly and take away character and take away moral inhibitions. Sodom is here. Sodom is here. And folks who ought to know better are refusing to take a stand. They're walking the fence. They want to be Christians and sinners at the same time. You're not going to heaven like that. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of what? Beloved, those are not Brooks' words, but the words of the Lord. Tonight, Christ and the devil are in a controversy for the control of your mind. Jesus won't make you do right. The devil can't make you do wrong. You must decide. My uncle, who is a great preacher, put it this way. He said, it's like an election. Three votes cast. The devil votes against you. Jesus votes for you. That's a tie. Now, the man who breaks the tie is you. If you cast your vote with the devil, you've lost. If you cast your vote with the Lord, you make your peace calling an election sure. Would you say amen, beloved? Now, now the thing is this. Whether you decide with him or not, you are going to stand before the judgment bar for yourself. Rapping can't stand for you. Mother and father can't do it. The Bible says the Lord will bring you into judgment to give account of every deed done in your body. And after the judgment, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be what? Do you believe the word of God? If you do, say amen, beloved. The Bible says it's coming. Jesus is going to stand up from between God and man, cast off his mediatorial garments, and he's going to declare that awful decree, it is done, probation is over, salvation is consummated, it is done, and the Bible says the soul that sinneth, it shall what? And I believe what the Bible says. And the Bible says there shall rain down from God out of heaven fire and brimstone. It's coming right down here on this earth where we live. Up and down the streets of our cities and our neighborhoods, God's going to wreak vengeance upon filth and immorality and worldliness and sin. He's going to do away with it as surely as we are born. Sodom passed away, and so shall this age of Sodom. This earth shall become one vast seething lake of fire, and all who are caught outside of Christ shall die. So 
soul and body. Well, what's the alternative? Everlasting life. How do you get that? There's only one way. And Jesus is the way. He said, I am the life. Would you say amen out there? The Jesus that I love and the Jesus that I believe in and the Jesus who died for my sins. He has opened up a way. We don't have to be destroyed. We don't have to go the way of the Sodomites. We don't have to be destroyed in hell. Matthew 25, 41 says that hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. God doesn't want anybody else to burn in it. He gave himself that whosoever will should not perish but have everlasting life. Christ has made a way out of this mess. Through his blood. And tonight Jesus says, okay, okay. So you're born in sin, so you're weak. I can handle that. I'll give you a new birth. I'll give you a spiritual birth. You'll be a brand new creature. Like a newborn babe. You ever look at a newborn babe? A newborn babe has new hands. New eyes. New ears. A new mouth. New nose. New feet. Christ said this spiritual birth will do that for you. Even though you might be 70 years old, I'll give you new eyes. You won't go looking after the evil you once saw. I'll give you a new mind. You won't even crave the things you once enjoyed. I'll help you to hate what you once loved and love what you once hated. I'll give you a new mouth. Speaking the truth and speaking honorable things, I'll give you new ears that will refuse to listen to gossip and dirty, filthy stories. I'll give you a new heart, new hands that will do the works of righteousness, that will caress your own wife, new arms that will hold only her. I'll give you new feet that will march right past these devil holes and take you to the house of the Lord. I'll make you new like a brand new baby. I am the light. Lord, how do we get this? Come unto me. Come unto me. Oh, but Lord, it seems so hard. My yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Come unto me. But Lord, why is it I don't seem to want to do it? It's because you are carnal. Once you are spiritual, you will delight to do my will. I'll write my law in your heart. Would you say amen? This is what Christ can do. This is what Christ promises. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, all the things that we preach and believe, you can't just decide I'm going to do it. You've got to start with Jesus. He is the only one who can change your natural way. He is the only one who can turn you around. He is the only one who can make you what you ought to be and what you want to be. He's the only one can give you the victory. I know what I'm talking about. You can go hither and yon. You can pay your money. You can consult your doctor and your psychiatrist. They can't help you. There's nobody on earth except one. But thank God there's one. The blessed, blessed Jesus. He's the one. He's the one. And tonight he cares. I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. He cares. Look, I ought not tell you this, but last night we had a problem going home and had to be towed. And and my dear wife, who rises early, we didn't get home until 1 o'clock this morning. But you know what? We went home rejoicing. Because when we had that problem, and there's nothing I could do about it. There wasn't even a house nearby that I could make a phone call. And I said to my wife, we've got a problem. And I said, let us pray. And we bowed our heads and prayed. And I want to tell you something. Listen to me. That the cars were passing by. Nobody was concerned. We offered prayer and asked God to help us. And in two minutes, I looked and here comes a tow truck. <laughs> a tow truck. And I didn't even know he saw me. I just waved like that. And he pulled over and he backed up. And he took me to a place where we could find help. Oh, look at here. The Lord is interested in me. He's got the whole world in his hands, but he's interested in me. He sustains the myriads of worlds in his universe. But after looking after Mars and Pluto and all those other unnumbered worlds, he looks down into this world and he waves aside four billion people and picks me out, stranded on a highway. And he says, order up a tow truck. My servant is in trouble. That Jesus, 
is interested in you. Desperate to save you. And tonight all we need is Christ. Oh, beloved, don't you want a better life? Don't you want to be a witness? Don't you want to be faithful? Don't you really want to overcome this old world? Don't you want to be a stalwart for Christ? If you do, would you stand and let's pray together. It's time to go home. And bless God for you. Oh, my Lord. Tonight I'm praying for these people that again you've placed on my heart. You've made me love them. And I'm praying for them because I love them. I want to thank you that you sent them out here tonight. I want to thank you that you didn't just send them and then send me, but you came by here. That you've spoken to our hearts and that the Holy Spirit has impressed us. There is no man alive who can bring conviction and conversion to a human heart. That's the work of the Holy Ghost. We thank you, Lord, for caring about us. Tonight, tonight, we respond to this message by saying, Lord, we want to be what you would have us to be. We want you to fix us now. Get us ready for that grand and awful day when you shall appear and come riding down the skies in flaming fire to gather your people home. Fix us, Lord. Whatever it takes, fix us. Turn us around and straighten us up and clean us up. Fix us. Because the end is coming soon. And with all our hearts, we want to be saved. Bless us as we go now. Help us to think on these things and make us impatient to get back here tomorrow night. Not because Brooks is going to be here, but because Jesus is going to be here. Want to come and sit in your presence? We want to feel your touch. <laughs> there is someone who cares. When evil gets out of hand, there is someone who cares when vice corrupts this land. There is someone who cares. He'll give you grace to stand. That someone who cares is Jesus. There is someone who cares when you just can't behave. There is someone who cares when sins make you a slave. There is someone who cares, and he is mighty to save. That someone who cares is Jesus. And now may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord cause his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Peace in your hearts. Peace in your homes. May angels attend you as you sleep and keep you all day tomorrow. And tomorrow night, don't let anything keep you away from here. Our subject, an encouraging message. A message good for the worst sinner in town. Our subject tomorrow night is easy salvation for hard sinners. Oh Lord, keep us safe until then. And bring us back to worship thee, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. You have been listening to another special American Christian Ministries presentation. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette or reel to reel in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International copyright, American Christian Ministries. All rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations or for a free catalog, please call toll free 800-233-4450. International calls dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministries.org. There you will discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. If American Christian Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony? We'll share it with our speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He's coming soon.